Dr. Robert Glover, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you for your invitation. It's good to be here with you. And I, I as I've said, I, I love your background. I love your screen behind you. It wakes me up. Well, I'm glad it wakes you up because it's early in the morning where I am and it's uh, early afternoon, the day prior in the beautiful country of Mexico. Yep. How's your Spanish these days, Dr. Robert? Well, necesito hablar español un poco porque mi esposa no habla inglés, pues. So anyway, I got to speak English or Spanish most of the time because my wife and, and stepkids don't speak English, but it keeps getting better. I, I can't understand two Mexicans talking to each other. When my wife's talking to the kids, it's like, I don't understand it because she's usually just yelling at them and swearing at them and stuff like that. So <laughs> that's a joke. Well, <laughs> i got to say, I've spent a little bit of time in Mexico. I did a road trip there a few years ago with some uh, four crazy mates of mine. We drove from... Uh, from west to east, and it was one of the most fun, life-threatening, amazing experiences <laughs> of my life. And I, and I want to go back as a sober man these days. Oh, okay. And uh, be, it might be less life-threatening <laughs> to do it to do it sober, but not as much fun. Well, I remember one incident where we were driving. A, we had this um, been given this van, and we uh, we got a flat tire on one of these crazy freeways that you've got over there, and. And uh, we were, it was the inside right tire. So it was the one not exposed to the, to the road, but there was no, there was no off ramp. And, and as we were trying to change this tire, this, li this lightning and thunderstorm was bearing down on us. And within about a minute of getting back on the road and narrowly being run over by these massive 18 or 16 wheelers with we this most extraordinary thunderstorm came down and it rained so hard that all the traffic had to stop because you couldn't literally drive in those conditions. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the most amazing memories ever. So we, we a, have those thunderstorms here almost daily in the summertime. They're, they're, you know, everything floods, but it washes the streets and, you know, and, uh, but yeah, it's, you just don't go anywhere for an hour or so. Well, Dr. Robert Glover, this is, a highly anticipated interview for me because like you've seen in, in our email correspondence, I have to thank you for changing the course of my life in the most profound and happy way ever. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome. And thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me know that. I do like hearing it. Well, people must be listening to this going, well, tell us, Laven, how did Dr. Robert Glover save your life and i and i i'm I, listening how how did how did i save your life i'll give you the scenario i met a now ex-girlfriend speed dating and she was a beautiful zimbabwean girl she was a christian girl and we headed off immediately and i was in two months of sobriety at this point and and i fell head over heels for this girl and after about five weeks of dating, she said, Laban, I, I have something to, to talk to you about. And she said, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm saving myself for marriage. She was a virgin. And she said, I give you all veto rights to exit this relationship. I understand that that's pretty important to you. And she said, you have a week to think about it. And I said, I waive that right. I'm into you. I'll do anything. And then I spent the next 12 months trying to sleep with her. <laughs> and <laughs> after she told you she wasn't going to. After she told me she wasn't going to. And in the process, Dr. Robert, I broke that woman's heart and, and really ruined a lot of my own uh, being for a long time. I, I disrespected her cultural beliefs, her religious beliefs, and uh, really did a number on this poor girl. And... Uh, someone recommended your amazing book, No More Mr. Nice Guy to me and sent me on this path that we're on now. Fast forward five years, I'm now in a loving, committed relationship with the woman of my dreams. I'm masculine, I'm proud, I have boundaries, I have no more of these hidden contracts, which I want, want you to explain what, are, what they are I, in a minute. I, I would love to. But first things first, maybe let's just share with our audience who you are. But not just this guy hanging out down in Mexico <laughs> talking with you in Australia. Um, 
I'm, I'm me. I'm just an average guy um, that, 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 that wrote a book that seems like a lot of men can relate to. Um, yeah, who am I? Um, you know, I, I've been a therapist a good part of my life. I was actually a minister for eight years. I have two degrees in religion. I got a PhD in marriage and family therapy at 29 years old. And um, I've been bumbling my way through relationships ever since and trying to help other people uh, find love and, and keep love. And um, in terms of why we're talking, I, I'm a recovering nice guy. And uh, I used to, if you'd met me 30 years ago, I've been happy to tell you, I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But like you were saying, I didn't have boundaries. I wasn't very good at making my needs a priority. I, I was manipulative. I was passive aggressive. I was secretive, all the while thinking I'm a really nice guy. And uh, that all came to a head uh, two or three years into my second marriage when my uh, then second wife said to me, you know, everybody thinks you're such a nice guy, but you're not. You treat me badly. I, you treat me well, and then you treat me badly. She said, uh, I'd rather be with an asshole because I know an asshole is going to treat me consistently bad. But with you, you treat me well, and then you blow up at me, or you embarrass me, or you don't keep your word, or you lie to me. She says, you got to go get help. And I thought, well, okay, you're the one that's always unhappy and moody and never wants to have sex anymore. I guess I'll go get help. And I went trying to find out why me being a nice guy didn't make her appreciate me and want to have sex more. Um, I mean, we'd had a lot of sex before we got married. And on our honeymoon, she said, aren't you glad that now that we're married, we don't have to pretend to like sex anymore? I thought, wait a minute. I wasn't pretending, but I was a nice guy. And I thought, oh, this we'll, I'll, we'll work. I'll get her over this. And you know, that's, that's kind of always been my MO in relationship is get the woman over or through or down off the ledge, wherever she happens to be. And, and unfortunately that's not a very good relationship skill to have. Um, it may serve some, some cases. Okay. But not, not in general. So I, I, I actually ended up in a 12 step group. I, I expect you've maybe bumped into 12 step programs and getting sober. Uh, I, I ended up in a 12 step group for sex addicts. And because uh, my wife kept saying, you're a sex addict. I said, me wanting to have sex with my wife doesn't make me a sex addict. And I quickly found out I wasn't a sex addict. I wasn't having enough sex to be a sex addict, but it was like the best place for me to land because it was, a, it was just a group of guys met like at 6 a.m. once a week. And for the first time in my life, I was able to go and just open up and just be real and talk about my feelings and my past and my impulses and my secrets and my darkness. And, and, you know, nobody, nobody reacts. They go, thank you for sharing, Robert. You know, that's about all that you ever get. And, and it was liberating. And at the same time, I also started working with a, a female therapist. And in the very first session I had with her, she got a string out and put it on the ground and gave me a physical demonstration of what boundaries are. Now I was in my, mid thirties, my second marriage with a PhD in marriage and family therapy, I'd never heard of boundaries before. So you mentioned that term. And that was just like eye opening. You mean I can say yet? Yeah, no, stop. Don't do that. I'm going to get off the phone. Now, if you do that again, and we're done. I can, I can do that. It was, it was amazing. And so that began a journey of me just beginning to uncover this paradigm, this roadmap that, that I've been operating by that I'd internalized at a really early age, that if I'm just a good guy and do everything right, I'll be liked and loved and get my needs met and women will want to have sex with me and, and, you know, life will be good. Now, as I was doing my own work, I, you know, I was working as uh, in practice as a marriage therapist. So men were coming in to see me with their wives or girlfriends. And like, they were saying the same things I had. You know, I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. I'm better than her ex. I treat her well. I give her everything she wants. I try to make her happy. It's never good enough. She's never happy. When's it going to be my turn? And when, when's she going to want to have sex again? You know, and, and I thought, man, I can finish her sentences for them. So I'm, I'm, I thought I'm not the only one with this paradigm of, of how to do relationship or be in the world. And then you add into the, the single men that would say, you know, how come I always end up in the friend zone? You know, I treat women well. I'm not the jerks I hear them complain about. You know, they talk to me about the jerks that they, they don't like, but keep going back to. And they tell me, oh, someday you're going to make some lucky woman so happy. And I'm going, why not you? How come you don't want to be that lucky woman? And so I kept hearing this theme, this meme around nice guys, but none of them were happy. 
none of the none of us were getting what we wanted so about uh 25 plus years ago i started my first no more mr nice guy men's group we met every other week it was about eight guys and i just started writing just chapters to give to these guys about what i was learning about nice guy syndrome and then over time, these guys and their wives and girlfriends said, Robert, you need to write a book. You need to go on Oprah. This could be a bestseller. There's a lot of people that need this. So it took about seven years to write the book, about three years to get it published. It came out in print to early 2003. So, you know, 18, 19 years ago. Uh, I'm not a math major, but been in a little while. And um, it's been translated into several languages. And, um, you know, the, the sales of it go up every year. So it, it, the word is spreading. So, so yes, when I do get those emails from people like you that say, thank you, Robert, this book saved my life, or how do you know me so well? Have you been following me around? I read every one of them because, you know, I like knowing that. So that's what brings me to this place right now. Well, it's good to know, uh, based on our conversation <laughs> offline, Robert, that, uh, not many men are sending you love heart emojis in the subject well, line of the Well, so, 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 so that the people know, yeah, uh, that, well, that's about, I, I, I live here in Mexico. My wife's Mexican, as you asked, do I speak Spanish? Yeah, I, I have to speak some Spanish. But, you know, my, my wife is the typical jealous Latina, you know, if she thinks I'm looking at any, or you're looking at her ass, you know, or that woman's flirting with you. She, she, she's just, you know, that's, that's how the culture is here. So I, I was sitting at, at, at our kitchen table, just scrolling through some emails on my phone, you know, a few weeks back. And I, you know, I was just seeing what, what email I've got and, I, and I'll sit down later and reply to them on my computer. And so I put my phone down on the bar and my wife said, uh, which one of your uh, guy friends or your clients send you hearts in the emails? And I go, I don't know. I said, I opened my phone. I, this looks, you know, so I, without even knowing, I said, this open. I was looking at emails. Oh, look, this guy's in Australia. He wants to do an interview with me. Oh, look, there's three hearts. He said he loved my book. And I said, look, you know, he loved my book. He's in Australia. And so it, it, it came and went and gave us a good laugh. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to meet the guy that sent me hearts in an email. <laughs> well, I, I gotta tell you, uh, you know, and, do, and doing extra research and rereading the book as well. I'm, I'm identifying some key behaviors about me that, that still need some work, but I'm really uh, proud, Robert, to be able to uh, announce to you that on the eight attributes of what makes an integrated male, I did a, a trivia with my fiance, Anna, mm -hmm. last night on the couch, and she gave me perfect tens, except for the, he has integrity, he does what is right, not what is expedient part of it. Uh huh. And with the benefit of hindsight, I should have really dug a little bit deeper to make sure that we're on the same page. But I thought, you know what, perfect tens uh, apart from one. If you'd done the same trivia five years ago, I would have barely scored any of them. Yeah. What can you tell us about these, these attributes that are really so important in this whole process? Well, you know, when I wrote the book, I, I, I saw the problem, you know, okay, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the covert contracts, as I call them, you know, trying our, our manipulation to try to get people to like us and love us and meet our needs. Uh, you know, I saw our lack of boundaries. I, I saw our, our, our difficulty making our needs a priority and surrounding ourselves with people to want to help us meet our needs. I saw a lack of honesty. I saw the often a lack of connection with other men. I mean, I saw all, all these issues contributing to the nice guy syndrome. And so, you know, I, I wrote about those and then sent the what I'd written off to a professional editor uh, years ago. And I thought, you know, okay, I'm about done with the book. And he wrote back and he said, well, you're about halfway there. And I go, no, 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 I'm only halfway there. And, and he said, number one, you're, you're repetitive. You have too many illustrations, cut those down. So I did a lot of editing on it. He said, and you're telling guys, you know, what not to be, but you're not telling them what to be. And I go, I'm a therapist. You don't do that when you're a therapist. You let people discover their own inner wisdom. And he goes, this is a self-help book. You have to tell people how to do something different. And so out of that, I coined the term integrated male. Now we could call this anything. We could call it a good guy. We could call it an authentic man. We could call it, you know, there's, there's no right term for it. And that's where the breaking free activities came from that, that are through the book, the different, you know, homework assignments to help, help men actually apply the principles in the book. So when I talk about an integrated male, 
really we're, we're just talking about an honest authentic transparent empowered passionate what you see is what you get kind of guy not perfect in fact this isn't about being perfect nice guys are trying to be perfect and get it right it's about really embracing our rough edges our, our darkness our, our flaws our imperfections and being okay with them you know releasing that toxic shame that says i gotta hide anything from anybody that might create a negative reaction and, and i gotta work to make sure everybody approves of me it's just just you being you warts and all and 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 liking you and being comfortable in your own skin and telling the truth and being transparent and living life on your terms and going for what excites you and leaving the things behind that don't serve you. I mean, those, those are all just kind of, you know, a bunch of, you know, random traits of the integrated male. Um, and, you know, like I said, about as simply as I know to put it is just be a, what you see is what you get kind of guy who's living life on his terms and likes himself. And um, that's, that's, that's easy to get close to. That, that's easy to be inspired by. That's easy to have fun with and hang out with. It, it's uh, it sounds so simple and, and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really proud and I do talk about this a lot. I do love the man that I've become Robert. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was that healing that really sort of uh, expediated this, um, this development phase. And it was your book and another book by Pia Melody, which I read later, Facing Codependence. Have you come mm -hmm. across her work as well? Yeah, she's on my reading list. Um, I, I, she was, you know, probably some of the earliest books that influenced me uh, were by Pia Melody and uh, um, uh, Robert, John Bradshaw, uh, you know, Healing the Shame that Binds You. So, you know, some of these people that kind of preceded Brene Brown, you know, who now is, is really popular, talking about shame and vulnerability and, and codependency. Yeah, so some good stuff. Well, it was, uh, to, and to give you some context, my, all of my dysfunction stemmed from divorce and ha having parents that were sort of ill-equipped to handle their own emotional needs and esteem themselves, let alone their kids at times. And one of the questions I had for you, I, it was the letting go and the forgiveness of both of those parents that was really profound in my healing process. But I found myself recently developing resentment towards my father. And we had a rather large disagreement uh, about six months ago, which was recently resolved. But I find myself incredibly frustrated with him. And it relates to him not being a strong male role model. Mm -hmm. And I was really curious to know if you had any thoughts or ideas on how to best manage that that relationship or whether I just cut it completely because it's 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 quite challenging for me as we speak. Okay. And I hear that. And you know, I I, I had to deal with the same thing. And um, you know, Robert Bly in the book Iron John, really the, the whole book is is about, you know, making peace with our fathers and kind of uh, undoing the ties with our mothers. And um, he says in that book that none of our fathers were near as good as we think they might have been or near as bad as we think they might have been. And he says, we can't keep living with these caricatures of our fathers. He says, we either got to take them down off the pedestal or up out of the gutter and just see them as real people. Again, flawed or broken people. And one of the pieces I've been telling men, because most men I work with had to have some kind of dad issues. And, um, and you know, some of them, their dads were, were absent or, or philandering or abusive or alcoholic or, or nowadays I hear a lot more, their, their, their dads were nice guys. That, that That's exactly what he was. Yeah. And they were nice guys. And basically the, the main life skill they taught their sons was don't piss off your mother. Because that, mm -hmm. that was his his way of trying to relate to, to the woman he was married to. And while he was passive aggressive and avoidant and all those things. But here's the thing. If, if you go back a, a few hundred years, not very long, we, we had a lot of male influences in our lives as little boys. You know, we probably grew up on a farm around, you know, grandfather, uncles, cousins. We, were, we had a lot more male influence. If you go back more than probably 10,000 years, anthropologists tell us, we were tribal. And, and we were raised by a tribe of initiated men, uh, of men who had been initiated by their fathers and grandfathers, how to deal in the world of, of the scary masculine, 
how, how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, how, how to get the things done that needed to be done for a tribe to survive. And boys got initiated that in a very, in a very conscious, um, visceral way by the men of the tribe. So in, in a sense, boys were raised by, you know, a tribe of men. So no one man, no matter how good of a man our fathers might have been, no one man could ever raise their sons in a complete way. So I guess what I'm saying is that every, today, every human boy is going to look at his father and say, you were incomplete. You know, you could have been better, could have done more, could have done this. You know, like my father had his, his major flaws and imperfections, but, but, but he had some positives. He, you know, he, he taught me to play ball. He threw balls to me, pitched to me, came to all my ball practices, took me camping, fishing, a lot of good things that I have amazing memories about. But he was also uh, moody and unpredictable and narcissistic and self-absorbed. Um, but he had good traits. So I, I, I can look at these positive traits and say, but yeah, he never really taught me how to go make money or how to be with women. And, but I might have been with a father who taught me how to make money and be with women, but ne maybe never would have come to a ball game for me. So no matter who our dad is, he's, he's going to let us down. I mean, I, I know I've got a 35 year old son and I, I know I was far from perfect with him. In fact, he's, he's, he's a great dad. He's got a 14 year old daughter, my, my granddaughter, and he's, he's an amazing father. And I, I often tell people he, he observed what I did and, and did the opposite. That's why he's such a <laughs> good dad, but even he's got his issues. He can be a little bit of a helicopter parent with, you know, with his daughter and putting a little too much pressure on her, a little bit too high, high of expectations for her performance. I have to remind him sometimes, remember Grant, she's, she's a girl, you know, don't put demands on her like you would a little boy. Um, and, and, you know, but so he's a great dad, but he's still got the holes in there. So in my journey with my father, um, I, I went through a period several years ago where I, I didn't talk to either of my parents for like about 15 years. Um, you know, I was going to, I was working on my nice guy stuff. I started setting boundaries with my mother. She kept pushing back on that. I'd gotten divorced. I left the ministry, um, both of my parents didn't really say anything direct about it, but I think they had some issues with that. So, you know, I, I felt like they were, they were like pushing me out of the mainstream of family stuff. And I got tired of just trying to fight my way into my own family for like holiday gatherings. Or, so I, I just withdrew and um, for 15 years had no contact. Now, what happened is I read an article about baseball. And, and, you know, the, the start of a new baseball season, like it's this time of year here in America, baseball starting up. And my dad taught me to play and, and I've always loved the sport of baseball. And, and so I felt grateful. And so I wrote my dad a note after 15 years and said, Dad, I just want to thank you. I'm, I'm grateful that you, you know, taught me to play sports and gave me an appreciation and spent time with me doing that. And I just want to say I'm grateful for that. I didn't hear back from like for six months. And then over a period of years, and then as my granddaughter came into the picture, so I saw my parents more at gatherings or like birthday parties, um, I, you know, I reached out and spent more time with my dad. But even then, it was still, I, I lived 20 minutes from him, but we saw each other maybe twice a year. And I just realized he was at the limit of his capability of human functioning. You know, that, that was just, that was all he was capable of. He'd kind of turn into a recluse and kind of got where he just told the same stories over and over again. And then about 11 years ago, he had a stroke and uh, passed away after about 10, 11 days. Well, during that time, I spent every single one of those days at his bedside and my mother was there. So my mother and I hashed out everything we had between us. And um, now, you know, 11 years later, I, I think we have a boundary supportive relationship. And, um, you know, and that feels good. So it, it, you know, there's no straight path for how to do this, but here's one of the things that helped me the most, uh, not just with my parents, but it, with relationship in general, because it was about the same time that I reached out and reconnected with my father. So again, this has been, you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago, I, I was single. Um, I'd gotten, you know, I'd gotten divorced in 2002 for my second wife. I'd never been single as an adult male. And so it was, it was a great experience. And so I lived alone for several years, got good at dating. 
but I, I reached kind of a point where like, you know, I, I met a, a few really great women, but for whatever reason, they couldn't get all the way in with me. I've met a lot of other, you know, just great women, but you know, they weren't right for me. So, and, and so I was kind of in this place of kind of a pity party, you know, kind of a poor me kind of place of thinking, why is it so hard for people to love me? Why, why have all the people in my life loved me so imperfectly? Why, why, why is that so hard? You know, and I, I, I was kind of, you know, poor me about how my dad hadn't been a good enough father or how my mother had been this way or how my first wife had been this way or my second wife that way or these girlfriends, you know, my, even my guy friends. How, why is it so hard for people just to show up and love me and be in a relationship? And I, you know, I, 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 I kind of, you know, was getting tired of my own, you know, pity party. So, I, you know, I finally reached a point. I thought this isn't serving me. And by focusing on what I perceived as the negatives, the shortcomings of the people in my life. So I'd been practicing gratitude for a while before that. I learned that in 12-step program of developing that, that abundance attitude, that attitude of gratitude. And um, so, I, so I decided, okay, I'm going to, instead of focusing on how every person in my life has loved me incompletely, let's just, just assume they all have. But instead, I'm going to focus on what I'm grateful for with each person. And with my mother, you know, she, she taught me to be self-sufficient. She taught me to cook, how to do laundry, how to sew, how to take care of stuff. My father taught me sports. He taught me a love of, of reading and history. Uh, uh, my first wife taught me generosity. My second wife got me into personal recovery. She was the big stick upside the head. You know, another girlfriend that I loved, but it just didn't work out. She taught me the joy of uninhibited sex. You know, and, and I just started looking at what I was grateful for. And then the funny thing is, not only did I find a lot of forgiveness for all these people, and I, I, quit, I quit being upset at them. And, um, and it opened the door for more really great, amazing people to enter my life that have, that have blessed me in many ways since that time. So I, I had to turn focusing on the negatives and the disappointments into focusing on what was positive and what I was grateful for and realizing every single human being is going to disappoint me. They're all going to let me down. That's the nature of being human. There is no unconditional love. There is no perfect parent or perfect partner, but we can still feel blessed and grateful for what, what, what these imperfect people do bring into our lives. And that was very liberating for me. Damn. I thought you might say that. <laughs> I think what a lot of it stems from Robert, uh, I've developed a, a repulsion to negativity. And I'm sure you've read enough self development books to know that, you've, that you become like the, the people that you spend the time around. And I really like for me to live a really fulfilling life, you know, I'm still on this journey that I'm on. And and I'm still a deeply flawed individual. And I've still got a long ways to go, but I, uh, you know, the amount that I have improved has been, you know, exceptional, uh, in my own opinion. And uh, but one of the one of the the challenges with my father, he's incredibly negative, and he self deprecates, and I find it so hard to be around. And I think it's, it, I look at it in a way that I've done all this work. Can't you just start doing it a little bit as well to improve mm -hmm. your own life? Because and he, his health hasn't been we, great either. We, we we don't get to put that on people. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and 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 I hear you. I I limit the amount of time I spend around negative people. In fact, it's about zero in my life. I I don't hang around negative people. Now, I I have compassion for negative people. They usually they usually feel helpless and victimized and done to and like the like. The world has, you know, control or power, and they have none. And um, but I, I'm like you. I, 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 it's just great song. I mean, it's like you know, the nails on a fingerboard kind of thing. That I don't want to listen to negative people. Um, and and you you can communicate things like this to people without it being attacking or telling them you should change, you should stop being different. This is actually where boundaries come in that you mentioned, and my um. My idea of the best boundaries are the ones that call everybody into higher consciousness. Now, we might set a boundary kind of like the, the machete boundary. So, Dad, if you're going to be negative, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, well, we, we can do that, but it probably isn't going to raise your father's consciousness very much. Um, 
and so I, I've, I've found there's a real neat little trick that you can try that's kind of disarming and invites people into a higher consciousness. And it's real simple. You just begin by saying, ouch. Now, that gets everybody's attention. You know, if you just go, sure, I got your attention. Ouch. And, you know, you know, a little animated facial expression. I mean, don't overdo it, but say, ouch. And you, then you can add anything you want from there. And you, you might say to somebody, ouch, um, that, that felt hurtful. Did you mean it to be? Ouch, that felt dismissive. Did you mean it to be? Ouch, that felt really negative. Did you mean it to be? Now, you haven't like pointed a finger or accused them of anything. You've just invited them to look at what, what you just experienced that created an ouch for you. You've owned your experience of it. Oh, that felt controlling. That, that felt dismissive. That felt hurtful. That felt uh, negative. Uh, that felt, you know, complaining, it sounds still a little too critical, but yeah, that, that, that felt negative. Did you mean it to? Now, now here's the thing. Like, you know, if, if, if your best friend or your partner does something that hurts, you say, ouch, that hurt. Did you mean it to? They have to ponder that for a minute. And they may say, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, really, I, I didn't mean anything. If it, if it hurts you, I apologize. I didn't mean to. So that's higher consciousness. They now learned that thing hurts you, right? And so they're more aware of that now, okay? And they'll probably be more conscious in the future. Or they may ponder it for a minute and say, you know, now that you mention it, you know, I have been pissed off at you for a little while. There, there's this thing. And then you can say, okay, I'd rather know about the thing than these little indirect jabs that hurt me. I, I'm, I'm listening. Tell me, what is the thing? And now you get your consciousness gets raised as they share things that you've done or haven't done that hurt them. Or the person, you may say, ouch, that hurt. Did you mean it to? The person may go, you know, you're so fucking sensitive. You're such a baby. Just grow up, man up, get over it. I don't hang out with those people. I, I don't hang out with people that are so out of touch with their own actions and how they impact people. I, I, I get a choice. And if I get a choice, I hang out with the people who, 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 I, who I feel good being around. Now you may have to limit the amount of time you spend with your dad, um, and you can even you can even say, you know, dad, that 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 feels just negative and critical, and you know, I, I feel it in my body. It doesn't feel good. It might even ask him, Dad, what are you really feeling right now? Are are, are you just feeling pissed off? Are you afraid? Are you overwhelmed? Are you helpless? I mean, you don't you don't play therapist with your dad, but a lot of times people don't have feeling words to go with their external behavior. And so, you know, you, you could just do it as simply as, you know, dad, are you, are you pissed off about that? Or are you feeling helpless about that? And then just listen, just listen. And, you know, you don't have to, again, don't play therapist with your father, but it might raise his consciousness. You might get to know him a little bit better where he feels helpless or trapped or stuck. And I mean, we all do, we all do. And it comes out negative. We just don't think our shit's negative. <laughs> we just think it's a legitimate complaint. Um, but you know, other people maybe go, ah, oh, you know, Robert, you're so fucking critical. You're so negative. No, but Mexican drivers really are all crazy. <laughs> you know? you know, like, I'm, I'm not being negative. I, that's just that's the truth. Having seen my life flash before my eyes on multiple occasions, I can verify that what you're saying. <laughs> you can verify that they, they are all crazy. <laughs> Yeah, my, my wife paid 500 pesos to get her driver's license and never had to go to got a driving school. So yeah, there's a good reason why they're crazy. That, uh, that's a brilliant explanation, Robert. And, and thank you for sharing that. I'm curious to know that that time in the wilderness that you had away from your mum and dad with any contact at all. Did you notice the the emotional draining effect of that? having to be separate in, in, in its entirety? You know, that's a good question. I, that was a period of my life of, of, of growing a lot. I, I was in a men's group for several years. I was starting, you know, to, to write the No More Mr. Nice Guy book. I was working with guys around uh, guys and stuff, working on my own marriage that, you know, had his own issues. Um, and so it, it, was, it was a time of a lot of personal growth. And in some ways, maybe that just, it just needed to be that way. It just needed to be that way. Um, and I'm grateful. 
I reconciled with my father before he died. And I'm grateful for my father's death that allowed me to reconcile with my mother. And because I've been close to her growing up, I was kind of her surrogate little partner. And that's why, why she was so upset at me when I started setting boundaries. She wanted to complain about my father all the time. I said, no, mom, when I, when I finally learned about boundaries, I said, I'll talk with you about anything, just not dad. He's my dad, you know. So she pushed that boundary every which way a boundary can be pushed. And I finally, that's one of the reasons I, I, I pulled back. But now, I mean, my mother had a stroke two years ago. She still lives alone. She's cap she can still drive. She's capable of a lot of things. Um, but I, I, I get up to see her every couple months and, uh, you know, check, make sure she's okay. Got enough stuff in her house that, that she's doing well. I book her swim uh, lane, you know, for her three days a week online. You know, I, I, I like looking at, after her and, and it, it's a boundary supportive relationship. And so I think we just had to go through certain things to get there. Now I, I look back and I think, you know, 15 years, that's a lot of missed time with family. But again, I was at peace when my father died. And, and, and that actually made my mother's life better when he died. And, um, and I, I'm at peace with my mother. If, if she were to pass at any time, every time I'm around her, I treat it as if it's the last time I may see her. And I, I consciously treat it that way. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very present with her and, and truly enjoy the time. And so maybe that was just how it had to be. And I, I don't judge it in any way. And so, you know, you asked me, what was it a strain? Actually, I think it, it, it liberated me in a lot of ways. Like, like I, I had to cut those ties to come back and form new different ties with them on my terms when I was ready for it. And, um, and, and in both cases, they seem to be ready for it as well. So, um, you know, I don't judge it in any way. I, I, I think I, I think I just need to go through it, and, and it was liberating in many ways. I do remember, you know, I haven't told this to many people. Um, they had a, a severe car crash right, partway through that time that I wasn't around them, and uh, my younger sister reached out and told me about it, and, and kept me kind of filled in on a few details. And it was very severe for my mother. She had to rehab in a convalescent center for like six months to a year. Wow. several surgeries it shattered one of her legs and she had a lot of grafts and a lot of work it was, but I even remember it during that point of time this is where I was still so disconnected and, and angry that I thought I, I wish they both had died so I wouldn't have to get sucked back into my family so I, I was still at a place where I had work to do and now you know every day in my prayers I'm grateful they didn't because I'm grateful for the relationship I have with my mother today so I'm grateful that they, they survived. But at that point in time, I just wanted to be done with them. But again, it's a process. And I think we got to go through whatever that process is to come out the other side with no attachment to outcome of how, what that other side is going to look like. And, and it is quite possible that, you know, that could have gone on and my father could have passed away and I never would have reconciled with him or been able to say goodbye. But I'm just grateful for the way it worked out. And I, I don't know that I would change it. It's so extraordinary that you share that, Robert. And, uh, and again, thank you for that. It's because I've had that thought as well. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you look at it, the the immediate, my immediate family and, and my extended family have all bore the brunt of dysfunction. And a lot of them exhibit a lot of this no more mis or this nice guy um, behavior. Uh, the women in the family, not all of them, but um, have issues setting boundaries and there's a whole uh, raft of dysfunction. And so I've had to become, you know, super ruthless with keeping a lot of family at arm's length. And, uh, and, and I know a lot of people will say you can't do that to family, but it's become really important and part of my own healing. And that's the whole point of this amazing book of yours. It's about putting your own needs first. Yeah. Why is that but, so important? Well, and you, so you can do that to your family. Well, the reason we have to do that, I mean, put our own needs first. You know, when we were born, we were dependent, needy, helpless infants. We, we, human beings are the most dependent, uh, offspring, you know, most dependent animal born on this planet. You know, we were dependent on our parents longer than any other animal. And um, that's, that's, just, that's just a fact of life. 
so our, our parents were put here, you know, in, in, in days past, the tribe was put here to, to give us what we need to get us to a point where we can be more self-sufficient, more independent, can, can take care of our own needs. Now, my definition of an adult is somebody that can take responsibility for their own needs. Now, we can't do that alone. And one of the skill sets I have to teach people is how to surround ourselves with resources to help our, us get our needs met. I, I call them cooperative reciprocal relationships. They're, they're the, the friends, the family members, the associates, the, the professionals, the practices, the hobbies, the groups, the organizations, everything that we consciously bring into our life that have a reciprocal flow of we give and receive. Everybody, everybody involved is giving and receiving to, in a way that makes it feel worthwhile to everybody involved. You and I now have a cooperative reciprocal relationship. You have a cooperative reciprocal relationship with the listeners of your podcast. If they go out and buy my book, I'll have a cooperative reciprocal relationship with them. Now, the more we can consciously fill our lives with these CRRs, I call them, cooperative reciprocal relationships, the more it fills our own inner bucket. And, you know, it's you know, not a very elegant term, but we've got this big empty bucket inside of us with a hole in the bottom. And we often go looking outside of ourselves to get it filled. I'm, a, I'm, I'm really big on, and you know, I'll bring in a couple of concepts here. I'm really big on, on that the masculine side of ourself, the doing side is responsible for husbanding the feminine side of ourself, which is the receiving side, which is the big empty bucket with a hole in the bottom. Now that means we got the masculine part of ourselves have to take responsibility for husbanding that feminine part for filling our bucket. And then I believe as that bucket overflows, we, we, we give love to others and that also attracts love. Emptiness doesn't tend to attract a lot of love. If you've kind of discovered that from, you know, if you're going out in the world trying to get love from an empty place, you actually just repel people, right? But if you're full and overflowing and you have that kind of energy about you, you radiate that kind of fullness. And, and I'm sure that just attracts a lot to you, a lot, a lot of just the feminine goodness of the world. And when I say feminine, it's everything that's not nailed down. You know, is 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 opportunity, is adventure, is money, is women, is dogs, is cats, is babies. Everything just is drawn to that kind of overflow. Now, the the mistake, since I mainly work with men, I usually just address this to men, but it's true for women as well. They have a masculine side and a feminine side, but most of the time, we men go out looking to feminine creatures to fill us up and make us feel whole and complete and wanted and loved. But I've been saying for a little while now that I believe it's the masculine part of the universe, the masculine part of ourselves that is a source of love. It's the feminine parts of the universe that are the receivers, seekers, receptors of love. So if we're going to primarily feminine creatures saying, love me, love me, love me, it explains why a lot of men are pretty disappointed in those love relationships, right? But if we, if the masculine in ourselves fills our own feminine bucket first, overflows and then is attractive to the feminine creatures we want to attract into our life, again, whether that's money, opportunity, adventure, uh, a female lover, whatever, however, you know, however we spend this, that, that, that makes us a lot more attractive, a lot less bitter by the way. So going back to your father, his negativity and bitterness probably has a lot to do that his, his own masculine self is not doing a very good job of husbanding his own feminine self. Because that, that, that the complaint, I, I, the way I put it, comes from our feminine side. I, I, we're, basically, our complaint is, my bucket's empty. It just, you know, there's nothing in it. You know, wah, wah, wah. And, and you know, that, that's, that's where the complaint comes from. So I don't remember where this began with your initial question about this, but I think if we take responsibility for, for getting those needs met, I think that was your question. Why is that so important? Then we don't go out into the world with this sense of emptiness and neediness that actually repels what, what we most want. We actually go out into the world just attracting all this goodness to us. And, and the idea that, that, we're, that we feel empty or needy never crosses our mind. But this does take work and it takes consciousness. Again, the, the, the masculine intentional part of ourselves has to set this up. You know, just as an example of how I, I nurture my feminine 
every morning. I've, I've got a, a nine month old pit bull sitting right outside my French doors of my office here. She wants to come in and sit by me. And uh, I usually let her, but right this minute, I'm, I'm on an interview with you. So I'm not going to go open the door. But every morning at seven o'clock, my alarm goes off. It's still dark. I go down, put the coffee pot on, let her out of her kennel. And she and I go out back and we get an hour and a half, two hours before anybody else comes around to bug us. And she just sits out there with me and I scratch her ears. I drink my coffee. I do some meditation. I do some visualization. I meditate on the flowers of the, the, the manifesting and unmanifesting, the cycle of life and death of the plants in my garden. I watch the hummingbirds, the squirrels, the clouds, the birds. All of that just fills my feminine bucket. It's just, I, I'm, I'm receiving, I'm soaking it in. And then when I open up my laptop and start writing and responding to emails and teaching courses and looking at my schedule, all masculine stuff, I'm filled. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to, to, to give to the world because I'm full. And uh, so, you know, I, I try to keep it just nice and simple like that, that if my masculine takes responsibility, surrounding myself with both people and practices that fill me up, then I'm, I'm going to bless the world. It's just, it's just in how I get up and walk the planet every day. And that radiates out of you, Robert. It really does. The, the way that you describe that whole process, that meditative process, I can, I can feel that energy come through you. And the timing of this is so interesting. We interviewed uh, my fiance, uh, I brought her on as a special guest host and we interviewed uh, Dr. John Gray from Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Mm -hmm. And he Lovely. just, he nailed it, Like you just nailed exactly what he was talking about and vice versa. Uh, and it's, and it's, uh, it's really good to, to get on top of that. One of the, the final areas of my development, Dr. Robert is finances. And mm -hmm. you talk in one area of your book about uh, whether it be a fear of, success or inadequacy uh how did you develop this really strong ability to to feel strong and building an income and earning a lot of money that's been a process that that's been probably one of my my biggest processes and biggest challenges um for for probably a number of reasons uh, my parental reasons. My father grew up during the, the, the depression in the United States as a young boy. He saw a lot of poverty. Uh, my mother was raised by parents who were directly affected by that. She came, she's a little bit younger than my dad. Um, they were very frugal, you know, the, kind of life, their life message was life is difficult. Life is hard. There's a few people out there just, you know, looking to scam you and take advantage of you. Um, I grew up in a fundamental Christian church with the message that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to go through the eye of the needle. I mean, th those were the messages I grew up with. And, um, you know, we always had enough as a kid. I mean, we didn't, we, you know, we were, I used to think we we're middle class. Then as I got older, I realized we we're probably lower middle class. I think we were probably upper lower class. Uh, we drove old cars. In the United States, states they have something called goodwill. Maybe they do where you are as well. People donate just stuff and then they, you know, fix it up and sell Salvation it. Salvation Army is the equivalent of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, we, we, have the, we have those too. We have those too. And uh, uh, we, Friday night, family recreation was go to Goodwill and just rummage, you know. <laughs> and I used, I used to joke that we bought our groceries at Goodwill. Um, but, you know, so we had, we weren't, you know, but we, 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 we weren't, we didn't have money. And, um, and, and, and for whatever reason, my own temperament, money's never been super important to me. Now, it's not like I'm one of those people who go, I got to make a million dollars by the time I'm 30. And, um, and I've struggled in life. I, I've filed bankruptcy in the past. I, um, you know, I've always hated doing my own taxes and this and that. Now I pay somebody to do all of my accounting taxes just i just i just pay them and they submit every form you know i i it, it is beautiful because and that's it, it's, it's hard for me and now i have an accountant who just does a beautiful job with stuff um i got a financial advisor two or three years ago who i talked to him once a month we have a zoom call and he talks with me about how he's managing the money i found that if i can just 
put stuff into like automatic type withdrawals. I don't have to think about it. And, um, but over the last, you know, few years, I've conscious, you know, I'm, 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 I guess my temperament is whatever I bump into that where I get stuck or it's not working or I'm repeating something that's not functional. I, I, I try to, I try to lean into that and, and see if I can find my way through either by researching it or doing therapy around it or getting a coach or a support system. And right now, probably the two biggest things for me are just health and fitness and financial, you know, I'll leave behind a lot more money than I'll ever need. You know, my book royalties will keep coming in long after I'm dead. So I'm not in a place where I need to make more money to live more comfortably, but because it's a place that's always challenged me, I want to meet that challenge, right? I, I want to optimize my earning capabilities. I want to optimize my ability to, to invest and manage money and, and manage my taxes. I want to optimize my ability to leave a, a gift, a legacy behind me, right? I, I've got enough money to be comfortable, um, but because I know I have some, some emotional blocks and some just some learning blocks, I, I, I'm leaning into those. And so at 65 years old, you know, like I said, I'm challenging myself around health and fitness. I'm challenging myself around even about, about converting my business to where it's something I can leave behind that will continue to generate income, to have trust and a legacy, both to, to benefit my family and to benefit the world. You know, maybe like have scholarships for young men to go to be able to go to Mankind Project, you know, weekends or stuff like that. So, and, it, you know, and bottom line is, I just don't, I don't want to be stuck on anything. I, I don't want anything to have gotten the best of me. Um, so those are the things that I'm leaning into now. And I, I, I'm still not anywhere close to being like an expert on, on how to make money or how to use it or how to manage or even how to be comfortable making a lot of money. I still drive old cars and, um, you know, I, I, I bought a 13 year old Mercedes AMG this last year. Uh, it's a beautiful, um, it's an ML 63. It's a, an SUV with the, with the biggest naturally aspirated V8 engine ever put into a grocery getter into, you know, a family, <laughs> a family SUV. And, you know, it, it's old. Oh, well, not really old. It's 13 years old. It's in great shape, beautiful car. And, you know, it was a $90,000 car when it's brand new. I paid 14,000 for it. So, you know, I, I'd rather go spend 14 grand and drive what, what was used to be a $90,000 car than go out and spend a $90,000 car. And, you know, I still have a beautiful, really fast car that I get to drive when I get up to my, it's, 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 I store it at my mom's house up in her garage. So I, I like, you know, having some nice, fun things, but, but more than anything, I, I like the, the freedom that, that money gives me to have adventures and to bless people's lives and to be generous and not worry about being generous. I'm, I'm astounded really at your honesty, Dr. Rob. And again, thank you for being so honest. It is exactly what you, you have written about in your amazing book about being honest and, uh, and how nice guys like to think that they're honest, but they're actually the most dishonest. <laughs> Well, you know, I smile because I, I often hear people say, Robert, I, I appreciate you're so authentic. And I promise you, 30 years ago, nobody ever accused me of being authentic <laughs> or transparent or so honest. And, and, and it has been a process. And I would say it was probably the number one thing I went to work on when I started working on my nice guy issues. And it's still something that, that I address in my life. I, I, I want to be that what you see is what you get kind of person which means it, it makes, it forces me to get comfortable with all parts of me, even the parts I don't like looking at or, or would rather they weren't there. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been saying for some time, there isn't anything about me that I've ever done or thought or felt or whatever that at least one person on the planet doesn't know about. And since I do a lot of interviews on a lot of podcasts, there are a lot of things about me that most of the world knows about. And, you know, it, and that's actually really nice because there isn't anything I worry about that somebody someday is going to say, Dr. Glover, I know this thing about you. And I'm going, what is it? And they go, it's da-da-da-da-da. And I go, 
yeah, everybody knows that about me. I talk about it all the time. You know, it's been in several podcasts and interviews. You know, I, I like knowing there's nothing that's going to bite me on the ass. It's, I think it's just, it's just the most liberating way to live. It is an incredibly liberating way to live. And that's, I think, why the podcast has been so enjoyable from my own development. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost therapy. Would you agree with what you've been doing? You know, yeah, why not? It's all therapy. It's all practice. It's all, it's all just growth. So, um, and, and, you know, and I, I, what I've been, what I'm enjoying is your vulnerability as well of inviting through your vulnerability um, you know, for me to match that with, with my own vulnerability. And that's just such, that's a beautiful gift we give the people around us. The more vulnerable we are, it invites them to match that with their own because most people don't feel safe being vulnerable, being themselves. And if the way we live and model that invites other people to take the risk of opening up, that's such a gift. We could talk about this all day, but we're not going to. Because I know you're a busy man, <laughs> but I want to know what is the future of Dr. Robert Glover. That's a good question. You know, it keeps evolving, and um, one of one of my intentions is to write ten books in ten years. Uh, I, so I'm writing a lot, and I've, I've you know, I'm, unfortunately, I try to work on about three or four projects at a time. The unfortunate part is that means it slows down any one of them getting finished in a timely manner. That is one of my, uh, that's one of my things that, that, you know, I know gets in the way. Um, but you know, there's just several things I want to be doing at the same time. So like right now, I actually just started a book on health and fitness called a uh, gym rap mindset. To, to basically just write about how to hack into what gym rats do to get the most success without spending hours in the gym or counting every calorie. Um, and I'm excited. I'm, 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 it's just going to be a, a, a lot of short, quick chapters, kind of like uh, Stephen Pressfield's War of Art. Just, you know, just a lot of just pithy short stuff. Uh, I've got a guy who wants to collaborate with me on a screenplay for No More Mr. Nice Guy romantic comedy. Uh, I've, I've got I, an idea for um, a series of graphic novels for young adolescent uh, boys and men that are struggling with identifying their masculinity. Uh, so I've, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm developing that. I'm working on another book called Positive Emotional Tension, which uh, explains why women need to experience emotional tension to feel attraction, arousal, and connection with a man and how we men tend to hate emotional tension in our relationships. So we never create it or kill it if it is there and then wonder why we end up in the friend zone or why our wives lose interest in sex over time. So that's the book I've been working on for a while that still has a little ways to go. And um, I, I probably have more books that I wanna write than I will have enough years to write them in. So, um, more and more, I keep shaping my, my life to just keep freeing up more time to write. Um, I never say no to an interview request. I like doing these. Um, I like speaking. I like doing seminars. I like teaching. So um, I'll probably keep doing that way. I keep moving more and more towards mindfulness and present moment awareness and consciousness. Um, I'm intrigued by the use of, of certain plant medicines in, in therapy, uh, ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, MDMA. There's re we're, we're really on the cutting edge, you know, science is right now of, of finding amazing ways to help people uh, with, their, with their minds and their brains and their trauma and their defense mechanisms. That's all new to me, but it really excites me. And uh, I'm, I'm, I, I see myself moving in that direction. I, I've been invited to speak down in Costa Rica at a, a retreat center that, that does ayahuasca and I've never done it. So I was supposed to do it last December, but COVID prevented that. Hopefully we'll get to do it this coming December of 2021. So I'm really intrigued by just new frontiers. And um, I, like I said, having turned 65 uh, just a couple months ago, and uh, going on basically the the, meta, the 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 healthcare system for old people in the United States, um, 
yeah, I'm, 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 I'm faced with the reality that death isn't that far off. I see my mother, you know, at 85, she's probably done have too many years left. So if I get another 20 years, I'll be happy. 30 years, I'll be ecstatic. I'm visualizing every day, blowing out the candles on my 104th birthday. So um, hopefully I'll write 10 plus books during that time. So that's what excites me. That's, that's, and you know, Quite honestly, if, you, if we do an interview in 10 years and you say, Robert, what, what do you have in front of you? What's coming forward? I'll probably have some new ideas and concepts that excite me that aren't even on the radar right now. So, you know, hopefully I'll live that long and, and have that opportunity to have new exciting things in front of me. Well, I've got some ideas that we can talk about off camera that uh, might give you another 20 or 30 years because my GP has a permanent record that lights up every time I turn up there that says patient is going to live till he's 150. So I like that. <laughs> I, and you know, I, 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 I realize that people in my generation might hit that and probably the generation behind me, uh, there's a high likelihood that could happen. I, I believe that. Your book on Amazon, Robert has 4,375 ratings at an average of 4.6. And I'm astounded that people that have given it a negative rating have given it a negative rating. Oh, those are the best ones to read. <laughs> you know, I, I, I rarely, rarely read people's reviews or ratings. But when I do, uh, you know, I, I can read two or three of the four or five stars and, you know, and, and they feel good. And, you know, I, I, I know pretty much what they're going to say because I hear it a lot but I like to go read the one star reviews or the no I, I don't know if you can give it no stars or not and and I love reading those and because usually there's either four or five stars or one you know there's there's not a two or three star it just doesn't seem to happen yeah so the one stars are entertaining they, they really are um most of them it's obvious they didn't read the book and and for a few of them they're going like yeah, this is just common knowledge. Why, why would somebody write a book about it? Why would anybody buy that? You know, so, you know, the one star ratings are typically, you know, along those lines or either that I'm just a total delusional asshole and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ruining all the good men in the world or something like that. So <laughs> you can tell they haven't read the book. You know, they're the ones where, you know, uh, so, so, some, some woman's husband or boyfriend read my book and decided to, to break up with her. And now it's my book's fault that that happened. <laughs> Where can we find you, Dr. Robert Glover? Well, yeah, you, of course, on Amazon, but uh, drglover.com, just D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com. You know, people Google Robert Glover or No More Mr. Nice Guy. I have, I have the top spots on, on both of those Google searches. So just drglover.com will bring people to, to the, where, where everything I've got going on, my podcasts, my classes, my workshops, uh, my books. So that's the easiest way. And do you have any concluding thoughts? I love your blazer. Uh, I want one just like it. And uh, I want to know what color it is and when <laughs> you got it. That's my concluding thought. <laughs> well, for those listening, it's a very snazzy, uh, I don't know what, what you'd call it, red. Uh, uh, so you know what I mean? It like. towards a little bit of a raspberry-ish color. It, it, is, it, it is actually raspberry. Yeah, or raspberry. Uh, and it's from Calibre which is a men's clothing label uh, in, in Australia. And if you let me know your size, Dr. Robert, maybe I can send you one and a copy of my book when I finally get it published uh, later this year. Um, and maybe you could even throw a review of the book as well. Yeah, I'll, 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 I won't give you a one-star review, <laughs> even without knowing what, but yeah. Yeah, if, if I look near as good in that blazer as you do, I, I, yeah, I want one for sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robert Glover. Love this channel? You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this video with your friends. You can help support this channel through Patreon or donate via cryptocurrency. See the links below. Hey, leave a comment. We would love to hear your feedback. Thanks for watching.